I think they just come in here to get out of the sun. Uh, what, a, what a privilege. I can't tell you how honored and delighted I am to be on this stage with the, the, the grand dame of, of animal care. Um, and <laughs> Temple entered my life. I was um, I was maybe I don't know 20 maybe that'd be 45 years ago. Um, and at the time it, uh, in, in my world, it was the first uh, time that Farm Journal magazine, which was a big magazine at that time, um, you know, million subscribers. When they first introduced Temple's work to the livestock industry, I got a hold of that magazine and uh, read the article about Temple's work. And um, you got to realize that up until then, in our family, working cattle was like not a fun day. Uh, it was. You know, are we actually going to get them in the head gate? We we had a we had Temple. We had a head. We had a, a old head gate. We inherited. We didn't make it. We came to the farm in 1961. But as a kid, I kept trying to get them in this head gate, and it didn't automatically close or anything. So you you had a person on a rope, right? A rope that would try to time the pull to when the animal was in. And then of course the animal's trying to get out. So you got to hold on that rope long enough to get it, you know, ranked around a, a post, and um, it was, it was, you know, it was always a little bit tenuous. Uh, are we going to actually get this or not? And um, you know, if there was, if there was um, one time in our family that challenged our, our, um, our faith life, <laughs> it was working. No, I'm not yelling. I just want you to hear me. You know? And. Uh, so, so uh, I read the article about Temple. She was she was just young at the University of Colorado at the time, and uh, was just you know you were probably in your 30s, just starting to get some traction, and um, and I promptly went out, ripped out everything that we had, and built it according to toward light but not into direct sunlight, turn right in a circle and go out where you came in. Kind of those yeah. three basic concepts. Those are the basic principles. Basic principles. And it, it, you know, we were, we only had whatever, you know, 15, 10 or 15 cows at the time. It was real small. And, um, and but built, rebuilt that thing out of, out of lumber that we got from a neighbor's barn that we tore down, because we didn't have money to buy lumber. And uh, we still use that sheep today. We've run thousands and thousands of animals through there, and uh, it just works really, really slick. So I, I honor Temple's groundbreaking work all those years ago. Uh, it's done nothing but change the lives of so many of us who handle animals in such a delightful way. Thank you, Temple. Well, thank you. much and as I said this morning one of the first things I did is to look at what cattle was seeing. You know, nobody thought to look at shadows, which way it's headed towards the sun. Uh, and I think one of the things that helped me, everyone knows I am autistic and I'm a visual thinker. Think completely in pictures so it was obvious to me to look at what cattle were, uh, were looking at and these other principles like going back to where they come from, that's a basic principle of handling. And the other thing is stop the screaming and yelling. Because it takes an animal 20 minutes to calm down if you screamed at it. That's how long it takes for them to recover from that. So the first step in working with cattle is to just calm down. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, Bud, Bud Williams yep. used to always say, um, "Whatever you're doing, slow down." Yeah. That, 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 that was that was exactly his um, his thing too. Um, when you came to our farm. My my takeaway from that day uh, that was that was just new, and I've I've written about it now extensively in um, Polyface Micro, my book about uh, small scale uh, livestock, was just understanding animals don't have a calendar, they don't have a schedule. They're, an animal an animal is not sitting here thinking, let's see now, I've got to go eat supper at six 
We're picking up the kids from soccer practice at seven. Uh, tomorrow we have a dental appointment. And, and so, um, so what I learned that day when Temple was at our farm and we took a tour, it was it's one of the most special days in my life. Um, there wasn't a dry eye uh, on the on the day when we got when we got started. Um, was was just how in the moment an animal is. Can can you drop, describe that a little bit? Well, animals on um, we can look way way in the future. Now an animal can see a little bit into the future. For example, on um, you headed towards the vet. It's been a bad experience. You make those certain turns, they know. That kind of stuff they can figure out. And, but it's fairly short in the future. Some very interesting experiment for blue jays done by Nicola Clayton showed that a blue jay can at least think 24 hours in the future. And I like to call this experiment the cheap hotel room and the expensive hotel room. And then during the day, the bird can go in either room. The expensive room has a mini bar fully stocked all the time. The cheap room has no mini bar, and then during the daytime they can uh, move through the lobby area in between the two cages. And then at night they randomly get locked in, in in one of the rooms. And after getting locked a few nights in the cheap room with no food, they'll take food out of the mini bar in the expensive room and put it over in that cheap room. And blue jays are um, are capable of of doing it. So that's some limited planning for the future. But, but in general, in general, they are, this is why routine is so important. That's like, right. for example, uh, Temple, one of the things that we found um, when we, you know, we do this real uh, mob grazing where we'll put, you know, 400 or 500 in, in, a, in a small paddock, you know, if the grass is real good, maybe, uh, maybe a, a, a three or four acre paddock, you know, yeah. three or 400 head for, for a day. And, um, I've had numerous people say, well, you know, my cows, they, they never said it. They, they're just like, they're always unhappy. Um, and what we found was that, that if, we, if we moved them every day at the same time, they began, even if, I, even if I shorted them just a little, you know, maybe I make the paddock a little too small. So, you know, noonish, they're a little bit hungry. They're content, they're content if they if they know every single day at about four o'clock somebody comes and moves us and and they're they're content to to wait those extra three or four hours and not ball or walk the fence or get balled up because there's kind of a trust factor well, they also, can, can you talk about that trust factor well they also know what time they're going to go because if it goes too long it, if you do everything exactly at four o'clock, then they freak out if it's a few minutes late. It's actually a so little bit between of, between three thirty and five thirty. That would probably be good. Yeah, no, that's right. Okay. Some little bit of variation in routine, like between three thirty and five thirty, would be really good. And then that helps stop some of that pacing. The other problem is I've been reviewing reviewing some of the literature on moth grazing, and some studies came out with some bad results. And I think part of the problem is since they were doing an experiment. You're putting like a whole bunch of cattle in a pasture. They were putting like six cattle in a little electric fence pen. And I think they, the animal can't watch its backside in that small pen. Yeah, well, like when you're like, um, if you're going to natural water, for example, a stream or a yeah. pond edge, and you don't want the cattle to go, you know, uh, poop in it and, yeah, and, right. and trump it up. Um, they they don't like to get within two feet of an electric fence, right? That's right. So so if you if you V this in so they they go in frontwards and back out because they don't want to turn around because they can't see their backside, you can actually have them drinking out of a natural water system without pooping in it because they'll go and drink and then back up, drink yeah. and back up. So you can use the confinement to... But that's for going and drinking. Isn't yeah, it that, that, that's not, that's not all they, the time. What they did in this experiment is they crammed like six cattle in a little pen and they were in there like a day and it, it wasn't coming and drink and then back up. Yeah. And I think they, they were stressing them out. Right, so, so some, of the, some of the folks that have a lot of trouble with you know, doing the, the, the controlled grazing, they said their cows can't and you start asking them, well, you know, uh, when are you moving? Well, um, sometimes I move them in the morning, sometimes in the evening, uh, sometimes after dark because I didn't get home from work. Uh, and 
that, that, that's where they, they, they can never really settle no, because they, they need never to have have some routine. Like I think between 3.30 and 5.30 is good. So within a two hour time slot, they're gonna get moved. But just having it all different, that's- uh, uh, I just learned way. something. Isn't that clever uh, uh, that, that, that you, can, you, you can, if you become too regimented, they're creatures of habit. Well, they can get too regimented, so you get the slightest little deviation, then you get into trouble. Right, right. So one of the other um, interesting things that's happened for us is we do, um, I want you to just get your take on this. We, we lease several farm properties in the area that we, so um, we, we move the animals around a lot and they're not contiguous, so we can't run them down the road. Yeah. You know, we gotta put them on a trailer, so we trailer them. So our average, our average animal, by the time it goes to uh, beef here, yeah. by the time it goes to slaughter, it's been on and off a trailer, I don't know, 10 or 12 times, you know, in an in a 18 month period, all right? And every time except the last one, when they get off, they're on brand new grass, brand new place. They know where trailers go. They know the trailers go to good food. I've talked to ranchers that big semi truck, and the cattle would see the big semi truck coming and come running. Really? The big really? huge semi truck. They would do that because they learned that that took them to good eating. Good, good places. So that that's the incentive. So so here, here so here's my question, Tim. We have we have a lot of small producers here. Yeah. They have very small uh, farms, and as a small producer, um. We small producers often pride ourselves in this animal was born here, raised here. It's never been on a trailer except the last day of its and life. And then it's freaked out. And then it's on the last day of its life. And it's so, going to be freaked out if that's the first time it goes on a trailer. Okay, so do you suggest, um, do you suggest, so I'm a, I'm a very small producer. Um, would you suggest putting the animals on the trailer uh, leaving them on there. <laughs> How would you acclimate? I think this is a great point because as soon as they get on there and they're freaked out, now they're secreting adrenaline. Well, what tends to and have, now the muscles are tightening up. Now you got tough meat. They will have tough meat. They're like electric prods and getting them really upset five minutes before slaughter. That will cause tough meat because when they get really excited, it takes 20 minutes to calm down. It's also very important that an animal's first experience with a trailer be a good first experience. This would apply to a horse too. The first experience is bashing your head. They're going to be afraid to go on the trailer. Now, I don't want to be teaching them to go on a trailer the week before slaughter because then you could get stresses or give you a dark cut. That's something you wouldn't want to do. But if you took some young animals... So, so how far before... So you've got a slaughter date at the slaughterhouse, I'm right? I'm going to start doing it six months before. Six months? You got six months, and you're going to put them on what four or five times? Well, no, I might just let's try to find an excuse to like rotate the pastures with the trailer. Oh, okay. and instead of just moving them on foot, well, you want to do both. You move them on foot, but they also learn they can go on a trailer and, and go to pasture. Uh, another thing that's often a problem is with hauls. There's a lot of controversy right now about if you have a really long haul to a plant. Well, that's bad. 20 hour haul, that's not good. But on the other hand, some of the most stressed cattle are the 15 minute hauls. Because when you put them on the trailer in a 15 minute haul, they don't have time to calm down. Now, if they know they're going to pasture, they're not going to be excited. But cattle first get on the trailer, a little upset, then they ride for a while, they calm down. But some of the worst dark cutters I ever saw in a big plant was uh, fed cattle that came from the feed yard across the road. And they were maybe on the semi for five minutes. They were that close. So, so extend that just a moment for us into, into the holding pin, the holding area. So, so they're unloaded. Do they, do they need to go the day before? What's, what's that no kind advantage. of time period? There's no advantage like? taking the day before. But what you don't want to do is just take them off the trailer and just run them right up to the stun box. That you don't want to do. Uh, they need to have at least an hour at least to settle. Uh, then another problem you can have if you've got cattle that have been raised in, in, you know, in a backyard kind of situation is uh, when they get mixed with other animals, they fight. And if you have fighting going on within uh, uh, 20, 
24, 48 hours before slaughter, that can give you dark cutters. So your basic principle is short-term stress, like shortly before slaughter, toughens the beef, and it also makes pigs have PSE. The long-term stress depletes the glycogen, uh, raises the pH, and you're more likely to get dark cutting beef. So I don't want to be- Wow, those are, those are great nuances. Um, so, so what you're what you're suggesting is you, you you don't you definitely don't want to mix the day you go if you're taking four animals to slaughter you don't want to take two you don't want to mix two of them that know each other two of them that know each other put them on a trailer and take them and put them in a pen. Well, also if they let's say they spent the night and they're duking it out and they're fighting like in the plant yards, you will likely have dark cutters the next day. That's something you don't want to do. If you've got cattle, you have to mix. You might want to do it two weeks before the show. Two, two weeks before, and then they go through their settle social. their differences <laughs> and recover from it. Uh huh. So, so uh, you want that social, you want that social structure to be well, well defined. You want them to know who the leaders, who the followers. You want them to dope out Some their of social. The worst animals to fight are animals reared by themselves. You take a bunch of backyard raised uh, steers and you put them in a big arena. It's like a bumper destruction derby of fighting. And if you do that 24 hours before slaughter, I guarantee your meat's gonna be terrible. You might have 30% dark cutters. See, if you're doing a show, a better way to do it is after you've had to sail maybe Saturday night, have the students take them back and put them in their tie-up stalls and then go to a plant and go to plant Monday but then they're not going to fight on the trail but when you unload them you get one hour to settle and then you can get them slaughtered before the fighting starts so you want to make sure that you take them to a, a, an abattoir a slaughterhouse uh, where you can put like if you're just taking two animals you want to be able to put your two animals in a holding pen by themselves you don't want to put them with, with those other six that are down here in this holding pen. You're going to fight. You see, that, that's the problem. Yeah. You want to, and the animals, that, a single animal reared by itself will be absolutely forced to fight. Yeah. Absolutely, totally the worst. So, so this is, is this good stuff? Yeah. It is good stuff, isn't it? Because, because so many of us, we struggle with, well, what happened to this animal? And sometimes uh, there's inconsistency, you know. I, I, I go and get the beef back, and this is fantastic. And then another time, it's, ooh, it's not quite right. What happened? Well, let's say we got to mix these animals up. I'd want to do it two weeks before slaughter. Two weeks before give slaughter. Them, and give them a chance to fully recover. If I have to mix animals. Okay, that's a great rule of thumb. Two weeks. To, so, so the, the, so the socialization. <laughs> well, the problem is that they spend about 24 hours duking it out really bad. Yeah. And then it takes a while for them to recover from that to stress. Settle. They don't recover that quickly. Are all are all animals similar? I mean, going down the, you know, sheep, goats, yeah, pigs? Yeah, they, they all, you know, be fighting. The big problem you got with pigs, because you have less of a problem with dark cutters and pigs, but more of a problem with pale, soft, watery meat. You know, like you at pork chops, the bottom trace is all full of water, and that there's genetic component to that, a big genetic component, and then there's also a, like, let's say, squealing and jamming, poked electric prods five minutes before slaughter, that wrecks pork. How That's about, nice. how about um, salvage diets, like feeding them bakery wastes and, and uh, you know, ho-ho cakes and M&Ms and things like that? Well, what you feed them will have an effect on how the meat tastes. But the basic principle with, um, with meat quality and slaughter is short-term stresses, like getting jammed in the chute, screeching and stuff like that in pigs, 15 minutes before slaughter causes tough meat. Uh, cattle uh, getting poked with electric prods multiple times, 15 minutes before slaughter, that tends to make tough meat. And then a short, a longer-term stress in cattle like let's say fighting 24, 48 hours, or you have a storm come through, where it's summer one day, snowing the next day, and if that happens 24 to 48 hours prior to slaughter, you're more likely to get dark cutting meat. The, so it's basically short-term stress toughens and lightens, 
long-term stress tends to darken and uh, uh, you'll, then you'll get the dark cuts. And okay, so the, so the short-term stress is what um, what makes, shortens up the muscle, well, the, the it connective them, it tissue. Makes them, it makes them tough. There was a study done by Robin or Warner, and I also have a book that you can order online called The Slaughter of Farm Animals, Practical Ways of Enhancing Animal Welfare. You can pick it up on Amazon, it's got it, and I explain these principles. I've got a number of papers online about um, one paper, it's called Cattle, Sheep, and Pigs That Are Easy to, easy to uh, Handle will have less stress and better meat quality. And you can actually find that online, Google Scholar, pretty easily. We skirted around this a little bit earlier, but just this whole idea of trust. Uh, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about docility, yeah. how docile the animal is. Those are gonna be more tender, in general. A, a docile a animal. A docile animal. But, it, um, could, you, could you just talk a little bit about the relationship between being a docile and, and trusting me. When you can have animal, see, when you really see the difference in the genetics of the animal is when you suddenly introduce novelty. Uh, like, let's just say an umbrella suddenly opening. Okay, the animal's never seen that before. The flighty genetics will have a bigger reaction than the calmer genetics. But you can have animals with very flighty genetics like the antelopes that we trained and when they're in an environment where they do trust, then you don't see that flighty genetics. But where you tend to see it, sudden scary novelty. Like I talked to one rancher, he'd done a lot of Bud Williams, really good low stress handling, really tame, his cattle were really gentle. And I said, yeah, but if a hot air balloon lands in your ranch, your cattle are gonna freak out. And he said, yeah, that actually happened. And they did. Because even if you've done the best low stress handling, something sudden. It's very important to get animals accustomed to some variation. Different vehicles, different people. Some of the animals that are worse, they're going to berserk, berserk when they go to town. They've lived too sheltered a life. These are animals that have fairly flighty genetics. One farmer, one old truck, that's all they've seen. And then when they get taken to town. And so, somebody, some, a cattle hauler with a big shiny feather like rolls in. And then in. they're scared to death of it. Uh. Um, where it's actually good to teach animals that different vehicles are okay, different people are okay, okay, if it's a show animal, different people are gonna to touch you, that these things are okay. And then they're less likely to get afraid of a show. All the time people say to me, well, my steer was good at home and he went berserk at the show. Well, you've got things that are flags, bikes, and balloons. I call them the big three. Now the fourth big three is drones. Dr oh, Ugh. I was, I was oh. waiting to mention drones on our place. Oh. Boy, we the, these you know we have a lot of video crews coming to our place to do you know different well, things. Let me tell you something and stupid. drone drones, our cows don't like drones. Well, if a drone just stays up high and very slowly comes down, most cattle will look at it. But if your cattle have been frightened by drones going like this across them, let me tell you something stupid a news crew did with horses. <laughs> um, talk about really bad. Um, they want me and another person to ride. They had two Western horses and they wanted us to ride them. I get out there and the horses are nuts, like almost rearing. They're all tacked out Western and they were not rideable. And we had to wait 20 minutes for them to calm down. We got on them. And then you know what this drone operator did? He came in like a plane coming in for a landing, like we're on the runway, right into us. Like you've got to be kidding. And that operator, like, he didn't get near me because I was going to chew his butt. <laughs> that, you know, now you could train animals to drones. And the best way to do it is, like, to show it to them. Now, if you take the drone up really high and just very slowly come down like this, most cattle will just look at it. But what you don't want to do is introduce it by swooping across them like that. That freaks them out. It's the same, it's the same thing as... Um you know, uh, a lot of urban visitors, uh, ur urban families who've never been around livestock, yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially children, they, they're they used to being um, aggressive with their bodies, hand motion yeah. and all that stuff. And, and if, you've, if you've been gentle and calm around your animals, just somebody being hyper around them is enough to 
kind well, of get those edges. Well, this is where they need to get exposed to view things. One of the big things I've seen with dogs now, we have very strict leash laws in Fort Collins. Dogs are afraid of everything. There's more problems now being afraid of the vet than there ever was. Because they haven't gotten used to having enough other people handling them, going to different places. They live in almost too sheltered a life. This is a fascinating concept of the difference between gentleness but also acclimation. acclimation. I, I don't think I've ever heard you talk about acclimation like this, and I'm, I just, I'm sitting here eating this up. It's, uh, it's, it's really good stuff to, to, to appreciate that we, we need to, we know what's coming for that animal, and we need to acclimate that animal in advance uh, to, to, to prepare them, just like we would our child if they're going to their first, whatever. Um, oh, I get asked all the time, autistic kids. Their first birthday the, party. Yeah. Or first autistic kids at the airport. Oh. I mean, a basic principle is no surprises. Surprises scare, all uh -huh. right? So let's go look up the TSA video, and, and, the, and so they can see what they do, and they also need to get ready. The guards may cut you. Well, let's not have that as a surprise. The other thing to reduce fear in autistic kids is make it interesting. I used to be terrified of airplanes because when I was a senior in high school, it was an extremely scary emergency landing, and we had to go down the chutes. I've actually done that. And the way I got over it is I got a chance to go with some dairy heifers. Miami Airport, 1970s. The airplane torture place. And they had this old um, constellation full of dairy heifers. I got to ride in the cockpit. And then when we got back, they had drilled holes in the bottom of the airplane for the urine to drip out. Con con uh, con Constellation is the name of the airplane. Constellation is the name not, of the airplane. Not something in a galaxy. No, Constellation is the name. She was called the cow shit Connie. And, and uh, Constellation is the name of the airplane. And then I got to watch them torture a 707 Badger jet. I didn't go on it. And they were hauling meat to South America. They'd stripped out the chairs and they were strapping sides of beef down to the chair runner holes. And we had to clean one of those. And what I learned from that is you can torture airplanes and they still fly. And this is all early 70s. This is Miami Airport early 70s. I want to make sure this is not something happening happen now. Absolutely not. But you see, you make something scary interesting. You see, and this is sort of how the novel works. I showed that picture of the box uh, this morning, and you put a box in the pen, the cat will come up to it. But if it suddenly just blows across the pasture, they're going to be afraid of it. See, novelty is both scary and attractive. Attractive when you voluntarily approach, scary if you suddenly just shut in their face. Yeah, one of the things when, when you were at our farm, uh, another one of my takeaways of that day was that you said you said the animals were so um, into the moment that they knew if the logo on my hat changed. Like if I if I wore a John Deere hat and then tomorrow I wear a whatever you know a, 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 home, a homesteader living hat. Let's bury the hat some. Very the head. Okay. In other words, teach them that a variety of things is okay. In other words, you train them that some variation of routine. Now, I like the idea of moving the passion between 3.30 and 5.30 because it, 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 that's a little late afternoon. Not right. just having it all different random times. Right. So there's a real it, balance between There's that, a balance. B between the, the, the regimentation and the variation. Well, that's right. And between the gentleness and the acclimation. Or, or say the, well, ru the routine and the acclima and the acclimation. But you want to get them acclimated to, the, you know, a four wheeler is okay. Yeah. And when you first introduce it, don't be chasing them. That let's feed them. When you introduce a new person, a new place, let's say a brand new set of crowds, for example, let's make that first experience and that crowd a good first experience. Like maybe feed them in, walk them through the shoot, but let's give a few treats. People have gotten into trouble with acclimation. Well, I'm gonna run these cattle through this chute five times and they go, we don't wanna do this anymore. But you give them a little treat and well, they'll do it. Yeah, one of the things that uh, we learned from you that we've had very good success at our place is um, you know, we, we move them every day to a yep. new paddock. Well, where you locate your corral on your place, try to do it as centrally as possible so that 
um, on some of your paddock shifts, you can just run them through the corral for, for nothing. Don't do anything. But just, they're going to a new pasture. Yeah, exactly. So they're so, going so, to associate yeah. the corral lot signs with pasture moves, right. which equal good eating. Right. They're just in, so so literally when we started doing this temple, now I can I can call them. They'll follow yeah. me down the lane. I step aside at the gate. They go in. I close the gate. And, and I go around and open the other end and they go to another paddock shift. Now, I to and and so there's no there's no adrenaline, no. fear, or stigma of going into the corral. Well, that's right. On the other hand, you want to make sure you get a controlled movement through the gate. Because you can get a situation where, especially cows with new babies, charge through a gate and leave the babies behind. So you want a controlled movement through a gate. Another problem that can happen is um, cows getting pushy. And then people accidentally reward pushy behavior. Like you open the gate and they're shoving on it, shoving at you, now you're rewarded shoving. Same thing with feeding. You're gonna put some supplement out and they're mobbing a four-wheeler. Well, don't put the feed out. Now you've taught them to mob a four-wheeler, which can get dangerous. You see, you wanna oh. teach them to have manners by, okay, just stand back a little bit, and then when they're nice and polite, not pushy, then you put the supplement down. That is so hard to do because when the when the when the cow is sitting there, you know, moving her head or stomping her foot, or the horse is is pawing, the, you, 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 the, the temptation is, well, here, you know, quit. Here, now, what quit. you want to do, and, and this is exactly opposite. It's great. This is the opposite. What you have to do if a, if a cow is really bad with pushing, is if they just stop doing that for two seconds from the yeah. feet down. And you've got to get the timing exactly right so the horse or the cow makes an association. And when they stood still, they get the feet. So, so she's pawing, and you're holding, you're holding. And then as soon as she quits. One second she quits, put the feet right there. You go. That's, that's, and have it all there and you scoop it and you just dump it out. That right there was worth this session. That, 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 because it's right, it's so counterintuitive. You know, we, I want to do this with kids, with kids, you know, in, impatient kids, um, quit whining, right? But you know what worked with me to help learn mm -hmm. patience? When I was a very young child, this is a really important thing with autistic kids, turn-taking games. We play board games where you have to wait and take your turn. And that helps stop a lot of this really impulsive kind of behavior. Because autism, autism tends, tends to make you impatient. You know, autistic kids tend to be impulsive. Yeah. So when I was three years old and four years old, there was a lot of emphasis on turn-taking games where you have to wait. Now another thing with autistic kids is they have a slow processor speed. You see, if I was a computer, I'd be on Intel 286, but I've got the cloud for memory. And so when you're... Okay. We're just we're just loving you. We're just loving you, Tony. That's all. We're just loving you. But the, but the, uh, so when you're working with a child, teaching them language, you want to use their words. Give them time to respond. They're like a phone with one bar of service. It takes time sometimes to kind of download the word. And the, the teacher gets too much in their face like this, then they freeze up. It's like a computer freezes up when you're clicking on the mouse too much. It's sort of to say, I had to learn not to do that. Wow, that's great. That's great. Good stuff. So, um, kind of, we'll, we'll change subjects just a little bit. Okay. Um, so this morning, you, um, I, I just really appreciated your, your dealing with exotic genetics. Um, there's, as you know, in, in our movement, there's almost a, uh, what would I say, uh, almost a cultish um, interest in heritage genetics. Um, uh, so, so you, you said, well, what you want, you, you have these trade-offs. You know, you um, you go for this and then, and then you get this, you get lameness, you, like, you know, big cattle. Yeah, we, we um, 
we got a couple cold cows from a neighbor. We kept them six months to clean them out, and then we ground them up into hamburger. One cow weighed 2,100 pounds. Well, this is ridiculous. It's not like a Sherman tank. We call her Sherman. That's ridiculous. And then I just worked for the meat processor, and they had 2,000 pounds or more of ragu, like black face, white face, a white face yeah. cattle cross, 32 inch wide shoot, and it got stuck in it. They, wow. put a, they put a gallon of Dawn on it. And this was a very tame cow. And they were rubbing its neck and everything. It was in the shoot building. Slaughter yeah, plant. Wow. And uh, it was loving to have its neck rubbed, and then it finally slid out. But he was, was getting it way too big. And what ranchers like in Nebraska have found, where you don't have quite as so much rain as you do here, that a moderate sized cow is what you want. You don't want these big, huge cows. You gotta feed hay up on them. You don't want to feed that to the big, huge cows. So it gets down to what is the optimal size cow, and it's not these great big cows that people are breeding for me. Well, this so this um th this wagyu thing you mentioned, it's really a fad right now. Well, it's a fad. Uh, out, I saw out, some out west especially. I've seen some horrible looking animals. Horrible looking. Feet. Because they're they're basically bred to be sumo sumo wrestler well, cows well, in this Japan. This is the problem. When you breed for that, you get horrible legs. And I saw Wagyu, all the stuff I've seen real recently, post-COVID, shovel hopes this long, really lame, really hesitant, come off the top deck of the semi, and it was all genetic. But the cattle were hideous. Right. Okay, so um, you're certainly familiar with Tom Lasseter. Yes. The, okay. the, the beef master breed. He had these six, yep. six criteria. Um, my favorite Tom Lasseter story uh, was uh, somebody asked him one time, one of his things was a cow has to bring in a calf every every fall. Every year, no matter what. Every year, no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. So, so some wise guy in the audience one time asked him, uh, "Well, Tom, what what if a calf got struck by lightning? You know, you wouldn't call the cow for you know a calf struck by lightning." He didn't bat an eye. He said, "She should never had her calf where the lightning struck." I mean, totally unforgiving. You know, no, no, no. But the other so, thing that he had is that the calves to be kept had to eat a a treat off the end of a uh, Yeah, docility. Docility was one, of his, was one of his things. So, what I'm going with this is, this morning you, you, you talked about not doing exotics and not selecting for one trait. Um, how do I, so, you know, I've got animals, you know, sheep, goats, cows, pigs, chickens, whatever. Um, at our farm now, we're hatching. We're hatching our own uh, laying chickens. Okay. And um, and so we've we've got to select. You know yeah. what are we going to do? And so our criteria is: uh, Are you old? Are you healthy? Yep. Are you productive? We don't care how big you are. We don't care what color you are. Are you old, healthy, That's sort and productive? Of like last That's a little bit like last yeah. year. So I'm I'm asking you now to. I've kind of showed my hand here a little bit. Okay. What, when you say select for optimal performance, drill well, down what, on that well, a little all right, bit. Tell say, us what you're looking for. All right, let's just take chickens. There's all the stuff about slow growing broilers and everything. And uh, one of the problems with that is the feed conversion. Okay, if you take an older breed against a modern breed, I like visual analogies. I got four semi truckloads of grain at a truck stop. And to feed some of the heritage breeds, a fifth of semi has to grow, right. drive up there. That's not very good. Now maybe what you do is you back off just a little bit and maybe you have only half a pickup load of grain pull up. In other words, you back off just a little. I mean, we went... Well, like at our farm, simply by not having them in the pasture and not having lights on them at night, they're, they're about 10% slower growing yeah. just because we don't have lights on They actually sleep at because night. Because pasture lighting in the pasture Be stimulates you. Well, well, because they sleep at night. Well, yeah, they sleep at night. So, so that that slows them down as well. But go, go ahead. I, I interrupted you. Go ahead with with your with your thoughts about optimal genetics. You're, so you're well, selecting a breeding. I have been in this industry now for I've been in the cattle industry for 50 years. And when I first came into the industry in 1972, uh, about two years later, when I was working for the farm arrangement, we got into the giant what we call European exotics phase. We had. We had Angus and we had Herford as our main cow. So all these big Charlets and these giant Simmentals were going to save everything. And I'll never forget our county agent, this is in the desert in Arizona, said, 
there's not enough groceries on the desert to feed those big cows. So everybody did this and then found out that was bad. Then 30 years later, we repeated the same mistake. And people in Nebraska and other places where it's more arid realize they just can't feed those big cows in the winter time. What, what, drove, what drove that size? Meat, meat, getting meat. more meat. But then you got a ribeye that didn't fit on the plate. So people realized they had to back off. But they didn't back off until they really kind of got a mess with it. So here, here's my theory on that. On that, You tell me if I'm right okay. or wrong. And I'm, I'm happy to be told I'm wrong. Um, that, that a lot of it was driven by the processors because once you set up a meat saw or your, you know, your, right. your, your equipment, it, it, if, that, if that setting can give you, you know, 12 ribeyes instead of 11 in fabrication in fabrication size is, is a big well, deal it costs the same amount to slaughter a big one as it does a little one right in terms of labor but right now we've got plants that have had to raise the rails uh, animal getting stuck in the chute um, equipment having to be remodeled because so they breeding for width a height is much easier to fix than width. Right. It's a real problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can shorten them down quicker than you can thin them down, huh? Well, the problem is they don't fit in the equipment. Oh. Uh, you know, and there's going to be some expensive remodeling messes in some of these big plants because you've got cattle that won't fit up a 30-inch chute. So, well, should we be making them that fat? You know, like that that size of chutes worked up until five years ago. That's 45 years that size of shoe before. Wow, really? So yeah. this, is, this is a brand new... It, well, it's issue. something in the last 10 years. So, so do, you, do, you think, do you think it's going to stop and... Do you think they're going to make bigger shoots or are we going to we're going to well, get our animals down? Well, they make bigger shoots and you get so. small cattle and they turn around in it and you've got a gigantic mess. <laughs> and we went through that at a processing plant. I, you know, there was yeah. some small grass-fed cattle and they... 32 inch shoot, they turn around and run back the other way or they flip over backwards on it. And you've got a gigantic mess then. Yeah, that is. And this gigantic. is stuff that I've just experienced within the last six months. This wow. is real recent stuff. This huh. is not something from yeah, 10 years ago or 20 years ago. This is now yeah, stuff. That's fascinating. Okay, so you've got a herd of cows, herd of sheep, herd of goats, whatever. What, what can, can you give us a, a picture of what optimal genetics is. What, what are you looking for here? Well, let's say you know, we've what, been finding, in, in, you see you have different amounts of rainfall. See here you've got a lot of rainfall. You've got two, lots of water here. When you get out where I live, we're in a drought. Then you get in Nebraska. Nebraska is a very interesting state. You've got eastern Nebraska where you can dry line, land farm. Then you've got the sand hills. And you can't put crops on that. And you're gonna need a more moderate cow. There's not enough feed out there. Now places that get away with big cows are places where they have tons and tons of grass. The other thing I think we've got to start doing... So, so you're saying... Um, optimal uh, for one place uh, may, may uh, vary. Ah, uh, okay. It may vary depending on where you're at. Yeah, so so a place with higher rainfall, yeah. um, like Normandy, France, where Charolais and you know, bigger and animals were And that's where those out. animals came that's from. That's where they... Yeah. And I have been to France, and I've seen the pastures there. I've been to the UK where you got gigantic cattle, and in Ireland, um, but you've got the pasture to feed them. So, so they, you wouldn't, you, if, if you were in uh, southern Alabama, you wouldn't have Scottish Highlanders. Well, they, they didn't well, think about where Scottish Highlanders come from. You see, they were breeding cattle for. But you know, they're cute. Well, they made them huge. <laughs> but people that bred them would be bigger. Yeah. See, I'm concerned on some of these breeds. You know, they're going to be messing up some of these cattle. And that's not a good thing. The other thing I'm getting very interested in is we need to be taking corn and soy monocultures and every third year putting a livestock on it with a cover crop. And people are starting to do that. And there's a lot of people think, well, grazing animals are horrible. Cattle are really bad. They just wreck the environment. But if you use the grazing animal right on a cover crop, you can improve the soil. And people are starting now to realize that that's a good thing to do. And then you don't have to spray so much Roundup all over everything. Because now you've got Roundup that comes out of the corrals uh, on that cover crop. 